You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Something Rather Than Nothing. We are uh, here in Warbling Creek Studios, and uh, this is an episode a long time uh, in the making professional studios. Peter Bauer, uh, you know him as a producer and editor. Actually, you know, they would know you through your work, but they would also know through the Irish voice of Rachel Lally, uh, Peter Bauer. You know, I, I, I can't do an Irish accent. That just came through, right? I can't. <laughs> My last name's Volante. I can't do an Irish <laughs> accent. Um, but uh, Peter, I want I want you to tell folks about uh, about your about your studio and where the heck we are and what's in it. Give them give them some visuals. Tell them what's going on. Yeah. Uh, welcome to my studio. It's great to have you here, Ken. Uh, I think we've seen each other in probably a year. We were uh, well equipped to work from the distance uh, before. Uh, all this happened. Uh, Modern world of podcasting. Yeah. Generally, <laughs> our work exists uh, texting each other, uh, emailing each other, sharing files online. <laughs> uh, and we've had this idea to record in the studio uh, a live episode. So we're in my uh, studio. It's a home studio. Um, a lot of bands have recorded in here. My band practices and plays in here. And my kids come in here and hang out for some studio time. So it's, it's like Cosmos fun. Factory. Yeah. Cre- it's, uh, it's like Credence, man. It's like Cosmos Factory. We just need a couple bicycles in this room. Yeah. That's it, man. You remember Cosmos, <laughs> right? Credence. Got some uh, bikes next door in the, uh, in the garage. Uh, but yeah, this is my uh, little sanctuary. Um, and it's named after the creek that's uh, magically behind our house. You wouldn't think that uh, Eugene would have... You know, a creek in the neighborhood, but it does. I spent enough time in the Midwest where a creek is a crick. A crick. Crick. And I, 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 I didn't get that from the East Coast. I got it from living in Wisconsin. It was a crick and a rough for a ro- roof. Yeah. Roof. <laughs> a rough. A rough. You just say rough. And people yeah. People know what yeah. you refer it to, right? No, living, uh, living on a creek uh, reminds us that we all live downstream, so... There About we go. five minutes after it uh, starts raining, the creek really starts raging, and depending on the time of year and amount of, you know, runoff in the stormwater, it can get pretty sudsy and soapy. And yeah. you have to enter the stream somewhere, right? Remember, this is a philosophy podcast. Yeah, you know, a yeah. Big, big, it's a big... uh, it's it's a good spot though. It uh, it's what takes me to sleep a lot of nights, just listening to the creek. Let's let's uh, Peter. Uh, so. Um, one of the things for the listeners to know, uh, Peter Bauer, he, 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 you know, he does the the podcast, does a wonderful job, um, has a deep love of uh, deep love of music, uh, and we're in a studio and have the studio, and he plays music. Peter, what what? Uh, uh, I don't want to say talk about music, but like what like. What do you what do you what do you do in the studio? Do you do you do you dabble? Do you dabble with sounds? Are you making songs? I mean, what what the heck you do? It's like a playground for your interests. So, what is it? How do you spend your time? Yeah, man, it's a, definitely a workshop, uh, a little sanctuary, uh, a little Zen retreat. Uh, it can be a place to host friends uh, and bring folks together. Um, so it, it really serves many different roles. Um, you know, sometimes we'll be out here when I when I play with my band, uh, Blazar. It's uh, really experimental. We'll pick a key and kind of go off for Blazar. 15 or 25 minutes. Uh, and so in some ways, this is a space for exploration uh, and finding sounds and rhythms that transport us beyond where we presently were. And I always feel like it's working if I come back from spacing out. I think, oh God, we, I've, I've been playing music this whole time and I completely disappeared into my own brain and came back in and we're still playing music and that's awesome. Yeah, so you, what was that, that? Do you have to do that more now because of the pandemic? You know, seriously, I talk to a lot of artists and they're like, you know, shit, you know, they, they're creating art to create, uh, create other planets, create other worlds and, and inhabit them. I mean, some of them are. I mean, do you find yourself needing to take that trip like musically to be like, hey, uh, this is crazy. I'm going into music land. What's going on with that dynamic? I, uh, it's, for me, it definitely 
uh, is an important part of my daily practice. Um, it's an important component of it, and I, I recognize that uh, when it is absent, uh, most of all. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I need to, you know, create a new song. Maybe it's as easy as picking up a guitar, you know, and learning a little cover song for 10 minutes on a break, you know, just to stretch that part of the brain. But uh, I played uh, clarinet in middle school and high school. Yeah. Uh, and so that, you know, that's like an hour a day of music, you know, in class, and then would practice for half an hour at home. Um, played in high school and uh, was even in jazz band, you know, my senior year. That's it's badass. It like started at seven yeah. in the morning. It was like zero period. So I actually got to school extra early. Right. I played the clarinet though, which isn't really like prominently featured in, in jazz per se. I mean, it has its places and moments perhaps, but it was more just the uh, playing an ensemble, uh, learning how to listen, learning how to process information very quickly, maybe sometimes seeing something for the first time. Uh, that was, I was saying to my wife the other day, that was one of the, my favorite parts of that experience was um, sight reading as a band. Okay. Uh, I feel like we might have even done that at a performance, you know, the band director passing out, all right, here's your parts. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of components. It's, it's working as a, a group. It's listening back to all the different parts and counting on people to be there. Um, and so when I went to college, uh, I went to Oregon State. Uh, in Corvallis, and I I didn't want to continue with symphonic bands. I wasn't interested in being marching band. I felt like I had kind of done that uh, for yourself. You yeah, kind of done that for yeah. yourself. I, yeah, you know, wasn't really interested in pursuing it any any further. But uh, I remember that Thanksgiving when I came home, um, I took my dad's uh, acoustic guitar up there because I realized something was missing. And what I reflecting back, I realized it's, you know, suddenly I wasn't playing music for an hour or two a day. Right. You know, right. and here I am living in a new city and new environment, new circumstances, and I didn't have that uh, outlet. Um, so that sort of, you know, moved me in a different direction. Uh, you know, hanging behind you on the wall is a guitar that I bought uh, by selling the clarinet that I had in high school. My parents were great uh, and said, you know, as long as you're selling the instrument to continue, you know, your love of your music, you're welcome to to do that. So I sold the clarinet on eBay and bought that Martin guitar. And yeah, I, I, I the ironic thing is I've met, yeah, I play drums in all the bands that I'm in. Cause yeah, I always have friends who are way better at guitar than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have really good guitarists, right? That's, a That's good, right. The good problems to have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we were, I was, uh, the first band I was in, uh, we were auditioning a drummer, uh, and I had uh, that, it's that Marshall amp over there and this, Awesome cheap Fender Strat uh, that I got for like two hundred bucks at Guitar Center. We went over there and Ben had a awesome drum set and he played and he's pretty good. Uh, and then he's like, "Mind if we switch? You want to switch?" I was like, "Okay, like I'll sit at the drum kit." And I was pretty good, you know, at the drums. I'd never played before, uh, but I didn't know that Ben had like already been in bands before and was way better at the guitar. Yeah. So we totally shredded. And we're like, oh, I guess we, we thought we were coming here to audition a drummer, but we got a guitar player. So. Dang. Uh, well, I, art combos work like that, don't they? I mean, a lot of time in music. Like, yeah. How, how to, I thought I was this, but no, I'm not that. I'm better as this in this constitution right. of things, Yeah, right? so you can imagine my, uh, my roommate's surprise uh, when here I come into our little two-bedroom apartment, garden-style apartment with a drum set. He's like, what? What is this? Like, yeah. Well, you know, I got to learn the drums. That's a different now, angle. That's a yeah. different angle. He's like, but we live in an apartment. I was like, I, oh, I got drum mutes. It's fine. But it, and you put up your Phil Collins posters. Man. You put those right up on the wall right then, man. <laughs> Phil, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, well, uh, th thanks, thanks for uh, for taking us uh, uh, along there. I wanted to ask you. Um, we obviously have the big philosophy questions, but we want to take a little bit of time of, you know, so like we got this creative uh, endeavor, you know, creating a podcast. And um, I mean, what the, I mean, both of us didn't have an idea what we were trying. Well, I don't want to say that for you. We didn't know exactly what it was or, or how to do it. So how do you how do you. When, I, when we're first thinking about putting together something that's interviewing artists and looking at creativity, I mean, what the what what the heck you think was gonna was gonna happen? What do you think it was would sound like? And you know? what do you think it is? Yeah, I remember uh, talking to you about it at a staff meeting 
at lunch, you had known that I had like recorded music and played in bands, and you told yeah. me that you had an idea for a podcast and you know art and philosophy, and we were talking about what it would take to do it, you know, setting up a shared drive, what kind of microphone to get, right? You know, how to right, right. This was uh, you know before the pandemic, so you know we were. I believe you're using Skype. For a lot of the early recordings, a couple years ago, all and the it early was just, ones, uh, it would yeah. come over as one file. But that's how we figured to get it as clean as possible. So we we talked about that a couple times. Yeah, and then I think after you had done maybe your first or second interview, you just sent me a couple files to like, hey, check it out. What do you think? And it, I just sort of like did it. Like I don't know. Like it, it just started to happen. And then we we got a really good workflow. And for me. Uh, it allowed me to have time in this studio doing, you know, production work um, on a project that I didn't have to do a lot of work on to get there. To get to get the content, like right. the content was there something to you mix do, up. You do with. the work. Right, you right. find the interview. You conduct the interview. Right. You send me the file, and we talk about it. You know, and we uh, like debrief it. But um, I would say it, similar to the difference between maybe a recording that I do for myself versus when I have uh, a friend's band in here and recording them, right? I get to sort of sit back and just be behind the board and mix things and focus on the sound and the balance versus bringing in maybe some of those creative components where it's sort of yeah. like trying to tap into the signal and bring something in. And Yeah, and I, I, and I, I wanted to say, it, 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 and the way you talk about it is about, you know, a creative collaboration in the dynamics of, of working on something. And of course, in talking to creatives about their process, it's, it's a, it's an enjoyable thing to create something about with somebody who's a creator and you're trying to create, there's this kind of nice, nice piece about it. And I have mentioned many times, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, with, with your talent, you know, the show being able to, you know, benefit and be in, you know, uh, to, to be as good as it is, like in the sense of how you make things. But one of the things I really like, and I know listeners have is when kind of like moving in between some of those songs and how some of those songs, beautiful songs that a lot of the performers have put together, just kind of like moving into them and some of the excitement that I feel or the artist feels, maybe the audience feels and moving through that sound. It's, uh, I love those episodes. I love the power of that music and cutting through that. Um, uh, what is it like putting it all together? I mean, does it feel like at the end it's like, yeah, that's how it should sound. There's that note or whatever. Yeah, the the musical um, episodes in particular are fun to kind of find, you know, in a song. Where is that? Where's the point that it maybe swells to and then work back from there? You know what I mean? So, well, there's a nice long instrumental interlude. You know, we can kind of softly fade that up for maybe 15 or 20 seconds as opposed to something that comes right in, you know, lyrically so it's fine to it's fun to try to find those bits but um th the most amazing thing that's happened t tens of times countless times is i always love the way uh and I, you don't do this intentionally but the way with the intro music the way that it kind of resolves in and around sort of that first question that we ask a lot of guests, yeah, you know, kind of what were you like as a, a young human? Yeah. And it's sort of always like the sort of this ethereal resolve to the uh, keyboard, you know, and then I don't know, there's a, it, it seems like it's intentional. Yeah. And it seems like it lines up perfectly and it does line up perfectly. Right. But it's completely accidental. And that it's it, that's what's exciting to me. Yeah. Like those are the moments that I chase musically. And so to even be able to find that in editing a podcast of these like, wow, things lined up in a perfect way in my brain. Unexpectedly, right? It's like a surprise. Yeah, going through going through that. One of the one of the cool bits, and I don't know that uh uh listeners know, um, we're gonna be putting together an episode um with some alternate takes, some acoustics, some pre-recorded live or new versions of songs from bands we featured or will be featuring, including Whitney Ballin, Spoonbender, our friend Sarah Bilt of Coyote, Buell Thomas, um, Gina Gleason, Gina Gleason of Baroness, Dirty Princess, and others to be announced. So, um, 
really excited. Peter, I know we've been talking about that, that episode, but um, I, the, the reason why I contacted you about doing uh, that episode, which uh, for listeners will hope to have out uh, in the next two or three episodes of the program, um, just having some like uh, performances or different performances or some energy of just the music, you know? Um, we're going to have some intros and some special guests to intro the tracks, but like a little bit of a little bit of a music treat uh, to enjoy and some variety. So uh, just one of your thoughts about how that, uh, how you expecting it to sound. Yeah, there's a couple of different threads uh, in our podcast that I, I really appreciate. There's obviously the philosophy thread. Uh, there's a painter thread. Yeah. Um, there's a baseball thread, which I love. There's a small but important baseball thread. Yeah, it, I, <laughs> it gets me. Uh, and then uh, I think music probably is continuing to expand in sort of the type of content. Uh, and I think, you know, for, for this format, for the audio format, um, you can, it's easier to resonate with the emotional content of a musical piece, uh, as it's described by the artist, you know, coming in and coming sure. out, um, in a way that is maybe more difficult to analyze, you know, a portion of a, a novel, for example, or the complexity of an abstract, you know, painting, um, you know, verbally, it's hard to describe something that's so visual. Uh, and so I think that's maybe part of the advantage uh, in some ways that a, a musical show has uh, in this context for connecting sort of the emotional uh, quality um, with what the actual art uh, is in and of itself. It's right there for you. It's uh, right I think there. that we have a, a really cool range, too, of, of music. Um, there's definitely, I know that you're a metal guy. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, that metal doom has definitely uh, influenced the music that I've been playing with my band uh, in a really fun and unexpected way. It I mean, seeps in. It it's, does. It and seeps I, in. I, I a played bit. in lots yeah. of bands. Uh, you know, m generally sort of like garage rocking, pretty loud. Um, but there's a a heaviness that I really appreciate. And maybe it's a Northwest thing. Maybe it's, it's a rainy day thing. It's but bad. it just sounds cool. It sounds cool. So I forced, uh, or I didn't force. I asked uh, everyone in my band to let's Go just try and let's detune. Let's detune a half yeah. step. Yeah. Uh, and it was yeah. It's just fun. And then it like you know even songs that we played a bunch of times because they're you know shifted down. They sound different. They feel different. The instrument responds differently. It sustains differently. Well, the, yeah, and maybe the emotional uh, feeling uh, is maybe that heaviness is underscored. Yeah, I think you pick up on on, on it a bit. Is uh, you know what what's doom? Doom's underneath the blues, or it's the foundation of the blues, or doom is just like abyss where the blues comes from. You know, it's it's it it it's, it feels. Uh, it's uh it's it's back behind black sabbath it is black sabbath it is the the slow down riffs of some classic rock and some yeah. classic metal like you said it's an adjustment and then you're in this land and that's where i mean it seeps in i'm not yeah i don't i don't slow hear and heavy it, yeah slow and heavy right? but it's not in a, i don't know it doesn't doesn't drag so i it's not for everybody you know uh but i think it's more approachable than maybe people realize. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? You can, you can ease into like it. Like shoegaze psych rock. <laughs> like that sounds like a really intense thing. And then you hear it, you're like, yeah, but this is cool. This sounds like yeah. stoner rock music. I love yeah, it. Yeah, we need to, uh, we, we need to, uh, got to ask you, Peter, got to make sure we don't forget the big uh, question. Got to at least knock one out. So what is art? Yeah. Uh, great question listen to lots and lots of answers, you know, in this podcast. And, and I think for me, I think there's, there's two components. Um, I think one is intention, like an artist's intent, a person's intent. Um, you know, am I, am I recording a, a cover? Am I just recording this for fun? Or am, is this a song that I'm going to play for somebody? Like maybe those are three different things, depending on the you know intention that I you know that the person brings to what they're doing. The artists themselves and their intent, yes. Yeah, they have. Um, it's almost like you're setting out to to do a thing, and uh, the act of the doing is like a maybe not a precursor, but it's part of it. It's not the whole thing, 
because right. I think the other piece of it is the the way that it's received by the viewer or the audience. And so I think sometimes it can be out of sync both ways where maybe someone says, this is art, and the audience says, no, it's not. Right, kicks it back. This is art. No. It's almost like you're setting out to, to do to a do thing. A thing. And uh, the act of the doing is like a... Maybe not a maybe pre not a pre pre part of it. It's not the whole thing. Because right. I think the other piece of it is the, uh, the way that the audience, 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 there is a tradition within art, since it seems to be an area that we enjoy, but we sometimes rely on experts to say, enter this room. This is a painting. You will have a painting experience. How much time do you spend in front of the painting? Do you look at it from a strange angle? When I go to a museum, I'm at the, on the floor looking up, up at the ceiling sometimes because I'm looking for things. But then there's all this behavior. How long do you hang around a painting? An hour? <laughs> Right. 10 seconds. What do you do with it? But I think some of the context, I, I th when you think about intention, is, is the context as well. When you see a wonderful work of art that's hanging on a tree in your neighborhood and you see a couple raindrops on it, do you stop and say, look, at that's the most wonderful piece of art? You'd be like, what the fuck? Why is there like a, a, canvas, a, a canvas like in the rain? It doesn't make any sense. Context. So what do you think, you know, what do you think that does to... Outside of intention, the context of what you view something in. I think it uh, helps folks triangulate maybe how they feel about something with a past experience. Mm, okay. and maybe these words or this image or this idea helps them then make a value judgment about, I like this, I don't like this. This is threatening to me. This is not threatening. This is weird. Oh, I totally, you know, connect with this. Um, but I think, you know, in the same way that maybe a narrator can be unreliable it's like your perception of the context is like the model that you've created for the context. Right. So it like makes sense to you in your Ken world. But like in my Peter world, those, it, are, those are different might not worlds. Even fit. Yeah. Might not even exactly. fit. Like how does it fit in? Right. right. And so I think that's why maybe there's disagreement between people of this is art, this isn't art. Yeah. And there, there, there's active, you know, there's active debates. And I, I always view it as in terms of history of philosophy. And we'll get into something a little more exciting. But in history of philosophy, you know, all the big... All the big philosophers, if, you, if you're going to be big in history, they all take a crack at what is art. I mean, Kant did, Plato did, Aristotle did, and not all the philosophers take a crack at it, but it's one of those questions you have to answer. Kind of like, why are we here? Why is there God? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is, uh, what the heck is art? Just that question, you know, and you have all the classics, not the name drop, but the big philosophers have, yeah. to, have to handle it. So it, it draws the the strongest human attention, at least in intellectual uh, uh, circles. Yeah, there's like an emotional component to it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what people are maybe drawn to is they resonate or connect to or, you know, feel drawn to a painting or a poem or a book or a song or a movie, right? And that's, maybe it's that seeking a connection or wanting a connection is very human, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe that's why we, you know, pursue those questions or pursue that well and about those questions i was curious about your thoughts about the nature of the questions i think one of the funny parts of the show and one of the things that i enjoy is that questions don't seem to be neutral or maybe they're not always feel neutral um i view them as more neutral in general i try not to trouble anybody with the question but um i the 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 thinking behind me creating the podcast comes from amanda palmer of the dresden dolls and she wrote a book called The Art of Asking. And what she described in a very open and revealing and exposing way was that rather than harboring the question or holding it or never asking it, she was going to make a lot, take a lot of risk by asking the question. So there's a favorable ask the questions, ask for help, ask for support, artist ask for those things to, to happen. So I've been very influenced by 
asking questions. I'm a trained philosopher. And what she had to say, to have the audacity to ask questions. Yeah. The nature of the questions themselves, how do you, how do you think they in general feel? They're strange questions. They're big questions. Um, in a pandemic, ask, why is there something rather than nothing? What is art? What is, how do the questions feel for you? Yeah, I think they're broad. Um, they're wide ranging. And I think they're approachable given the different kind of content that we try to interact with and mm -hmm. the types of artists that we try to interact with. Um, I think clearly in the past year, um, not everyone, but I'll speak for myself. I've, you know, tried to be reflective, mm -hmm. um, reevaluate, you know, things within my own life, systems, routines, behaviors, beliefs, attitudes. All that. Um, it's sort of like, uh, and it, you know, it, it depends on the week, I suppose, you know, um, I feel like we've all asked ourselves that, you know, like, what would you do, you know, if you were stuck on an island for a year? And in some right. ways, you know, many of us feel like we're stuck on islands, not all the time, you know, some more than others, some impacted, you know, incredibly. There's a psychological component. There could be a physical component to the isolation. It could be both. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, as maybe a society or a culture or a planet, perhaps we're at a more reflective point than we've been at other times in human history as far as um, sort of what comes next. You know, I don't, I don't really particularly subscribe to or believe in any idea of returning to what was. I think we'll emerge and step into what is and what will be. And perhaps some of the things from the past, you know, will we'll continue to move forward. But I think we're living through a time of tremendous change and have been, you know, for the majority of my adult life. You know, I turned 37 here at the end of the month. So, um think of my adult life spanning 9-11, the invention of the iPhone, yeah. <laughs> the COVID pandemic. These are What's... pretty like seismic shifts in the way that, you know, particularly American culture thinks and behaves. Well, what's so, so, uh, so, you know, part of the discussion is, you know, when does a pandemic end or when does it end? And people with the vaccine coming around and away from all the political chaos that, you know, there's a foreseeable conclusion to the pandemic uh, as we see it. People have been separated from each other. Peep sounds have been created, uh, thankfully, because of use of technology, individual use of technology, musicians, artists. Do you, is there a new sound that's going to come hmm. blasting out of this? Do you ever do you ever think about what the heck comes out? Because there's been a lot of people doing stuff for a little while that might be coming out. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, I would hope that to the, the extent that folks are able, they're using this time to sort of woodshed, hone their craft. Everything coming out will be in. doom or something. Yeah, uh, really <laughs> emotional. I, uh, what I'm amazed by, uh, you know, we're, we're in my home studio right now. Um, in the 15 years that I've been recording, just, um, the, the increase in the technology and the decrease in the price point makes recording at home very accessible for a lot of more folks. accessible, more, more trend. accessible yeah. as opposed to uh, feeling like you have to book studio time, um, in order to demo something. DIY yeah. Like thing. you can, yeah. um, I mean, there's been that movement, I think for, for a while, but, um, you know, to think that Billie Eilish's album was recorded at home, you know, with a couple right. thousand dollars worth of gear. And a know. brilliant piece of art. Yeah, you know, but, it's, but it's not like that was, it had to be locked away in Abbey Road studio for six right. months, right? right? So I think, you know, to your, to your question about sort of what, like what comes out of this, um, I don't know necessarily that there'll be a new sound, but maybe a refinement of, you know, people's instincts, what they had been trying to push forward. Um, I do think that uh, as things begin to open up in more parts of the country, um, I don't know. I think people are going to go hard for a while. I think uh, I think if they're they, going to want. If it's possible, uh, I think they're going to go hard nightly for as long yeah, as I, until I, it 
kind of they're, they're they're tired or yeah tap i mean out. uh we were talking earlier this week uh, <laughs> that you know the tap alcohol out. sales in america are like at an all-time high even you know previous to when restaurants were open so Which is... you know previously i thought oh people are just drinking at home but like no like those two things combined um <laughs> there's so I, like yes. that's probably not a great thing but to to get everybody uh back together you know seeing live music just to hear live music that communion just that that energy the communion the feeling of live drums and bass and seeing right. people dancing yeah and having it like uh i think people are going to really be drawn to that simultaneously right i've been obsessing uh, my brother-in-law just got um the oculus rift yeah, so VR. A VR headset. Yeah. Blowing my mind. I, I put him on the other night. I, th I said, I, I'm so happy to be alive right now. Yeah. It's amazing to be alive. What game were you playing? Uh, he had this really cool Star Wars game that oh, felt yeah. like I was watching a movie. Yeah. Uh, and the characters in it sort of guide you through the steps and you're touching and responding yeah. to. And I thought, is this the future of concerts? Is this the, like, can I buy, you know, can I spend 125 bucks to get front row at Bruce Springsteen? And have wow. the immersive VR. Like, when is that? At what point will that be commonplace, right? For a while there, we thought the Tupac hologram was going to be the, like the wave of the future, right? Yes. But it was like... Um, like, how did things converge? But it was like Polar Express, right? It didn't quite look right. It still looked... Remember what? that Tom Hanks Christmas yeah, movie? Yeah, yeah. It didn't a, look right. But there was a name for the effect, though. It was just something gosh. it wasn't... Uh, We'll, Somehow, have to like, put, so not, we'll have to put it in one of the yeah, hashtags. Hologram Tupac there is was a office. There is a but, name for the effect. How Polar Express was a little too close. Wasn't quite that type of thing. There's a name for the effect. Sorry, everybody. We'll put it in later. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a polar. It, let's, let's for now shorthand is the Polar Polar Express uh, thing. Yeah, but yeah, so it, gets, it didn't it seem right. Uh, yeah, it didn't seem one right. One of my uh, previous bands, The Walnut Collective, our last album we recorded together was called Hologram Jesus. Because okay. we were riffing on the idea uh, mm -hmm. on like a smoke break between like recording tracks. Yeah. Thinking of Hologram Tupac, like what would happen in America if you at a series of shopping malls, Hologram Jesus appeared? What kind of social impact my, my, would that my immediately... Blown. I want to say something. My mouth's open. The, the <laughs> listeners can't see. My, my, my jaw has dropped. I'm like what? That mind would, blown. That, like obviously the people would not, you know, believe that it was Jesus. But if it looked hologram good enough but it wasn't good enough and so to, like, to pull it back to the vr headset bit, yeah. that's amazing to me and it's uh it's you know you, it's not tactile necessarily but thinking of movies thinking of uh concerts yes. so it's like this this simultaneous sort of like uh dystopian black mirror bent right we'll all be plugged into our little pods uh and we'll be going to our 3d meetings Right, so that's one possible future, but I, I, I lean on this side that people are going to be so happy to turn their head and look at another human being uh, instead of just looking and, at and the little Hollywood squares on the screen. That's in some that way. That innate human um, need for connection, I think, will yeah. will continue to draw folks together. And so I would imagine, you know, I appreciated the headline that said, like, the Glastonbury Festival should expand from a week to every weekend for a year. Yeah. Just to, like, pull that whistle like let out that steam as a society i was just rage, telling well well in, in the the events that you you go to you know I, I left the message you know nowadays what do we do i left a video message for my brother and i left a video message for him talking to him about woodstock 94 that i went to he was trying to think of it and he was like what's that with perry pharrell and jane's addiction and i'm oh, like yeah. oh it's porno for pirates i love porno for pirates porno for pirates was one of the top 10 live shows i've ever seen in my friggin life and it was at woodstock 94 i can remember it like yesterday mind-blowing performance so then i started talking about it with them that's a music experience it's like all right yeah. so that's a long Commuter. time ago do you, at this I, point. i'm curious do you uh tell people that you were at woodstock I do. I use that expression. <laughs> I've, I've struggled throughout my entire life. I could, yeah. Hold up now. But hold up. Nowadays, I think you can say that. And I think it means for the, it might mean the Woodstock that people might know, not the older generation. Is it the muddy it's Woodstock tough to say. or the fire, no water Woodstock? Would, I do. What they I like use, ended up burning everything, right? I, I remember seeing I on wasn't MTV involved in none of that. sheets of plywood of being thrown on large. I don't know uh, nothing about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, where I come, I don't know nothing about nothing about that. Um, 
No, Woodstock, uh, Woodstock 90, yeah, Woods, I usually say Woodstock and then Woodstock 94, but the performances I'll talk about are uh, Porno for Pyros, uh, Peter Gabriel, uh, my girlfriend passing out from Southern Comfort while Metallica played the loudest <laughs> set I've ever heard in my human ears existence. She fell asleep. Um, Metallica definitely won. Um, when I got into the show was the Goats and another band named Jackal who did the Chainsaw song, which featured a chainsaw as one of the instruments. Uh, Jackal, this is the end of the Woodstock stories, and I'm going in reverse order. <laughs> the lead singer from Jackal, is, I think they might have pulled him off the stage. He had pulled down his pants, was drinking vodka and smoking a joint, and the, uh, that, that was the end of Jackal's or close to the end of Jackal's performance they got, at Woodstock. They get pulled off. That's how Woodstock began. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it started. <laughs> that's how it started. Hey, I we had mentioned uh, some of the some of the musical guests that will be on our concert episode. Really want to give a shout out to our musical guests that we've had on the show over time, and all our guests um, actually. But uh, talking a lot of music, so just wanted to mention Sean Wynn, the Praetorians. Big shout out, Run DMC style. Um, Mackenzie Rogers, Avery R. Young, Kim Gucci, Hawkins, Blackwater, Holy Light, Alicia Angel, Ghost Frog. Recent episode with Ghost Frog, that paranormal stoner punk. Uh, Death Parade got an upcoming episode with Randy J. Bird and his connection with uh, Doomed and Stoned in Bandcamp. And Doomed and Stoned puts together those uh, doom metal uh, scene recordings, uh, such as uh, Doomed and Stone in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Oregon. Washington, everywhere around the world. So nice service that they have there. So we've been blessed, uh, Peter, to have so many um, uh, musical artists and uh, you and I both being uh, music music lovers. Um, it's really been uh, nice, but I think one of the great joys is not only with the music, is the eclectic uh, yeah. sculptors and, and, yeah. and painters and and maybe if times we stretch out there, you know, talking about the art of pitching a baseball, hitting a baseball, like art, performance, these type of things. We've really been able to pull from a lot of different areas. Do you think do you think it makes coherent sense at the end of the day, or is it just really too disparate the constellation in the universe? Well, I, going back to what I said, you know, earlier about the questions, I think it I think those questions create a frame that sort of connects those different satellites uh, and maybe pulls them into orbit together. Because ultimately what we're talking about is process, creativity, inspiration, execution, um, presentation, interpretation, uh, reaction, uh, right? So that could be any, any one of the different Sure. mediums that we're talking about. Sure. Um, but really trying to grapple with that idea of, you know, where, where do these ideas come from? Where does this creativity come from? Where does this product come from? Yeah. Um, and so I think because of, because of the form that we, you know, that you bring to the podcast and the interview, it helps keep these things. Maybe I think of it more as like, maybe not a apartment building. It's, completely yeah. linear, but maybe more of a villa S sprawls Going out over off here. For a certain amount of time. You got a little secret gazebo Meander. down over here. Meander, hopefully. What's down this path? <laughs> That's interesting. Hopefully not to completely disappear. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> you know, no. for, for Wander out in the sake. woods for too long. Who's 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 the dream uh interview for the podcast for you and why? Wow. Uh, like just I don't know, a musician or whatever. No, it's like you mean it like Let's 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 do two of them. Let's do it two of them. Well, right now they got to be alive, right? It's, you know. Okay. I, there's some time in delay, not not for the morbid humor, but you know, alive people are alive. And then historically, who would you want to talk to uh, with these questions? This format. Yeah, sure. Philosophy, the big questions. Hmm. You know, uh, the musician that I would be particularly interested in. You know, talking to currently would be uh, the musician who performs under the name of Fortet. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of dancey, uh, electronic, sample-based. Um, 
but the incredible layers, I'm really drawn to the layers of his work. Um, a lot of bells, uh, uh, harp. I'm a huge harp fan. Oh, I love yeah. like Dorothy Ashby and Joanna. Not Newsom easy to and, pull off, but when it's it's I don't know. It's there's something yeah. it's, like it's a spiritual connection. It's a it magical maybe, instrument. Sound, sure. Like the way it resonates is so beautiful. Yeah, so yeah. To hear those elements brought into kind of like a dancey groove, right? It's really interesting to me. But the the separate component that I would be really interested in exploring. Uh, you know, in the context of this podcast is I subscribe to a playlist of his on Spotify that he updates maybe once a week, probably, you know, between five and 15 songs. So, so what, so what, what happens from week to what, what do you Well, hearing? that's the what? thing is it's like, okay. this is the music that he's listening to. Oh, so it's okay. like Sun Ra, it's Pharaoh yeah. Saunders, it's Alice Coltrane, right? It's this oh, wild, sure, sure. wild jazz. It's uh, Miles Davis. In, in, intellectually adventurous Right, as and well. then it's like house music, like just okay. grinding house music. Yeah. And then maybe it's like um, hip-hop, and then like doo-wop oldies. Nice. And then like King Tubby, 70s dub reggae. All right, drop that name again. Uh, Fortet. Fortet. Yeah. He goes. He has a couple different projects. He just released an album with um, Madlib, who is an incredible hip hop instrumental producer. Um, uh, Madlib had produced. Um, uh, who's the guy that just died, or he died recently in October? The mask guy, MF yeah, Doom. Yeah, yeah, MF yeah. Doom. MF okay, Doom. so Madlib yeah, had produced yeah, that. that right. It was some of those albums in the early two thousands. Okay, and then Fortet had remixed those, so they formed this collaboration. And uh, the current album that's out now, it's called Sound Ancestors, I believe. Could be wrong. Um, Madlib sent a couple hundred tracks to Fortet. Say what? And then Fortet just kind of put them together. Wow. <laughs> So it's like his interpretation of this like kind of iconic instrumental lo-fi hip hop producers body of work. And so what's interesting to me is like how do you how do you bring all these disparate um, inspirations, synthesize it to the core bit that you're most interested in, and then stack that up in a new combination that sounds simultaneously futuristic and old. I don't know. There's like a there's like well, a magic well, it, to it that like it I'm drawn into. It influences you though because I just I'm I'm in the position which the listeners wouldn't know of looking at your equipment and just seeing how there were sounds sounds in in tracks in pieces that were I the only way I would understand them again I have a rudimentary understanding of the magic you do is is being stacked up to, together as layers. Yeah, seeing absolutely. That's where it came from. Yeah, so it's it's those layers that are interesting. To me, you know, musically, what about uh, what about historic? What about historically? That's the bi the bigger yeah. one as far as you know, a, pod, a podcast uh, interview. It's one of those, you know, maybe a hackneyed question, but geez, right? Like who? Yeah, like like, like uh, you know, you know who? Uh, and I have my answers too, all right? Because it's part of my indulgence, <laughs> right? That too. Hmm, who would be? You know, I'd uh, be really interested in learning from and listening to this guy named Glenn Gould. Mm -hmm. He's a piano player. Yeah. Um, phenomenal piano player, like 50s, 60s. I think yeah. he died in the yeah. 70s. Yeah. Um, so precise. Right. So precise. It's like the most... Yeah. It's like 100%, 105. Like, how do, you, how do you do that? It's perfect. Right. So, you know... Uh, and he particularly was known for having this like staccato style where it wasn't like super heavy or like splatty, you know, piano, but just really delicate and light. And um, I think that ability to use an instrument to pull out such a dynamic feeling, right? That really intense, high volume, very quiet, right. spread out. Um, I'm really uh, amazed by piano players and people who can yeah, separate. So that's what you, that's what you, you know, really their, sink in their mind yeah. and body. Right, having your left hand play something that your right hand's not playing, right, and then you're looking at the pages, reading two lines at once, but it's ahead of what you're playing. Like uh, that, that 
I, I, I can't separate my, my mind and body like that, but I'm in awe of people who can. I think it's beautiful. I've seen, uh, it was one time I saw Joey DeFrancesco, and he was, um, he played he played with everybody. Uh, played the, I don't know all the technical terms, but this organ and just seeing his movement is like the best at that particular item, that instrument, like in, in the world. He's done some stuff even recently, like Van Morrison and things like that. I saw him at the Jazz Showcase, I believe it is in Chicago, but just seeing the movement and it's just incredible with the piano. I, it was tough to understand as an amateur observer, but I knew something profound was going on. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, another example I had uh, seeing that live was with, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, but there's the Jack London Review in Portland, and there's mm -hmm. a, a, a ongoing session with Mel Brown, a famous drummer, uh, and it's just just an incredible thing to watch that the the precision with the drumming and just how I understand like a classic, just wonderful jazz drummer and just being able to see that is uh, yeah and enjoy. experience that I think I think hearing live drums activates something in the human subconscious unconscious psyche your in your DNA. Uh, you know what the best part on the drums that that I that I find and my, my my son's recognizing me. He's like, "You love these drums." For me, I found it, and here's what the connection was for me. Again, I'm I don't speak with expert terminology, but it was within, I would say, kind of a progressive doom metal sound, and it was tribal. Yes, it's journeying drums, yeah. yes. journeying drums. Sometimes two or three of them at the same yes. time journeying drums as the underbelly the underpinning of the entire progressive doom metal song and you go because of the percussion it's i would put it akin to when you're camping it's that the way that your body responds when you hear the crackle of a fire whoa well right. i hear that just, crackle you need to put the you crackle just, but, but you you're pulled but you're pulled to it right <laughs> that warm that that fire sound or just it's Chris just the fact that you know when you I mean I, I'm sort of off campfires now I do a lot of backpacking uh, and you know with the wildfires in Oregon oh gosh you put a kibosh on that which is actually way better it's for the environment everything that would and, bring up still seal, feels too soon yeah remember, remember like, how we had those wildfires like, uh, yeah, yeah I'm during the like, pandemic still, yeah, like, I was times. like completely horrified terrified I wanted to hide days. thought I was going to die hellfire yeah. yes those Ones? Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So for me, a dream interview, probably maybe the reason something rather than nothing was created was to get Taylor Swift oh, as, okay. as an interview. And you know I'm a huge uh, a fan and a huge defender for reasons which I, I don't need to uh, indulge myself like, completely <laughs> with. But one of the things I want to say in the, in the context of the show is you end up listening to music over time in your life and then every once in a while you got your top 10 top 20 what types of what type of mood are you in right i'm 48 years old so what type of mood i'm in you might hear a different top 10 from me depending on my mood depending on how many i drop in there yeah the last two taylor swift albums that she put out and were reco recorded remotely in a pandemic are so in general so completely devastating intensely uh, emotionally driving deep down into the heart spear sounding spear piano spear strings a starkness that underrides the whole thing but also some moments of kind of like joy and and, and building up and and and, and temple but ultimately at its heart is like a deep rumination and she does more storytelling so she has auxiliary characters um just on an emotional level, and I don't, I'm not going to describe all the music and how it sounds. The way it sounds is kind of the way that I, I describe, but I don't think people know the depths that this album goes into because they're so deceived by it's not supposed to be that. It's, hmm. it's Taylor Swift. How can it have that depth? It, it comes from a certain source. Like, is it really that? And a lot of people have listened to saying it's really, really that. So I like the... The, the the 
tension between the artist and what they represent in culture and the art object itself. And I would say that these two recent art objects themselves are different, right. feel different. And so and maybe this uh, takes us back to the beginning of our conversation, the difference between the artist's intention and the audience reception or interpretation, right? You know, or their expectation of what it's supposed to be, or to what be it's led. allowed to be, or what it can't be. I, you know, don't we need to be let? I mean, don't I think that? I well, mean, that, I, I, that's a cynical read, but I find a lot of times that humans need to be. How am I supposed to interpret uh, yeah. the thing that's in front of me? Like, yeah. help I, me along. I'm nervous yes. to be wrong. Then I would say the vast majority of people need someone to tell them what to do or think or believe. Uh, or to at least reinforce and reaffirm that what you are currently doing or thinking or believing is accurate and keep doing that. Yeah. It seems like um, culturally folks need permission and direction. Not everybody, right? Some people like... A lot of people do. do I, I would say Not the majority everybody. of people do. I would. The vast sure. majority of people we, do. Uh, and, and, all, so, and part of all of us have probably feel a part certainly. of everybody Yeah, that's as well. it's, it's part of our imprinting as, you know, children. Right. Right. You, but isn't it artist? I mean, so are you leading to the point? I mean, is it, isn't it art? I mean, where, where you say to break, to break some part of that, that, that tempo or that inertia or whatever, isn't, isn't there some part of it where it's like, I can draw you to look at something. Think about the immediacy yeah. of photography. Yeah. Look at this. This is a civil war in Ireland and look at this violent photo. Look at it. It's an art. It's an activist piece. Right. And it, Certainly. Thrust you into so it. So in, in that, I think in that frame, then it, it pulls you in, it focuses the attention, it, it maybe helps you think in a new way. And perhaps that's what you're you know, sort of alluding to is like the way in which an artist can sort of push their audience forward or at least focus them or force them to maybe consider a different aspect or, um, you know, way that a song can be uh, versus what I perceived perceived it to be or expected it to be you know, based on maybe a past well, thing. Well, think about on the intention bit, and I want to I want to ask you this because it's one of one of our uh, favorite podcasts. Six uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other overseas has these thought experiments, right? And I think in philosophy, it's really fun to have this thought experiment. One atypical thought experiment has to do with uh, an artist's intention. So here it is. So the artists, uh, I am a radical feminist, right? I am tired of the patriarchy. I'm tired of everything, all my decisions, all aspects of my life being viewed through a lens that I feel is, is dominated by others and um, is highly problematic for me. I'm a feminist and that's, that, that I say that that's bullshit. Now, I'm an artist and in order to advance the feminist cause, I'm going to create this art object that is so vile and so detestable and its treatment of women, that the viewer is going to see this as an art object and see it as a vile thing. And I'm going to activate my cause from what I expect to be the reaction. Okay, so now I'm the artist. My intention is to probably, you would assume, to create art that is going to further the feminist cause or to attack patriarchy. But here my intention or the way that I look to do this, I am creating a vile piece of a misogynistic piece in order to spur others to action. So on the intent question is, is that wrongheaded or should an artist do something like that? Uh, what's the saying? Do the ends justify the means? <laughs> <laughs> it gets, it definitely gets towards that. Right. Um, you know, similar to, Similar to people needing to be led, I think that's inherently what leaders do, is they sort of forge new paths and say, here's a different way to think about something. And so perhaps if you have to use misdirection to get folks to think in a different way, I don't know if it... If you it's give a them, misdirection. You, I mean, yeah. going back to if the you magic, give, if we you give them a riddle, this, right? So, if you give yeah. them a riddle and they solve the riddle, right? It's the like, same. Did the riddle matter? It's the same or was Conan, it like, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, 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 these type of things are heuristics. People get get pissed off. I, I can get pissed off at you for coming up to me in the park in Eugene and riddle not, rattling off a Zen Koan and be like, "What the fuck's up with that dude?" Right? But I might have cracked through my understanding. Right. I might have thought about the Koan for half a second, achieved enlightenment, and you've helped me 
Like no right. other human being so can help another being. So was the Koan important, or it was the end result of right. your enlightenment as cracking a sentient being, right? <laughs> and I think that's what I'm getting to, right? Your egg. And so I, yeah, I think that part of what art attempts to do, perhaps uh, sometimes, maybe not always, is try to yeah crack the egg. Yeah. Uh, say, look over here. Focus on this thing. Think about this in, in maybe a way that you didn't think about it before. Yeah. yeah. Or have m- maybe more importantly, have your beliefs of how you think it is or should be confronted yeah right and then have to well why do i you know right why right. do i hold these beliefs to be true no I, I i i enjoy that um so we don't forget uh on the recording because we, you know we are engaged in a philosophical discussion which you know going back to the greeks what we're doing right here i'd imagine as far as the structure of this not to make it too highfalutin uh, for <laughs> for anybody but uh uh there is a highfalutin question of course that comes along with the show and we need to make sure we get it down on, on record uh, Peter Bauer of course listeners have been talking to Peter Bauer uh conversation me Ken Vellante your host but uh, Peter Bauer why is there something rather than nothing you've you've produced edited put together 73 70 plus of these dang <laughs> things why is there something rather than nothing yeah, each, uh, each answer is individual, isn't it? Um, for me, I think just sort of because it's been willed to be. And I, I would, um, I guess in many ways, subscribe to an existential philosophy that generally, you know, I believe my life to be meaningless, of no purpose, um, with no intention other than the meaning that I bring to it Mm -hmm. and that um, my life is a sum total collection of choices that were made that led to a certain outcome, which is called the present moment. Yeah. Uh, And so for me, um, there's a real uh, responsibility, I think, that comes with why there's something. It's because it's... Yeah. From my point of view, it's because it's what's made. I, I had a really uh, powerful experience uh, in my 20s backpacking. Uh, it's probably the first or second time I had taken mushrooms in a substantial amount. Right. Um, so, you know, so I'm actively choosing to re imprint, you know, reassess um, my imprinting and my conditioning and. Um, was just really struck with this sort of epiphany that this is just all made up. A hundred percent. It's just yeah. people made it. Capitalism, socialism, communism, Christianity, Islam, mm, marriage, monogamy, the, the con- family. Constructs. Yes. Of some, this of is, some sort, this right? Is of no meaning. It was just made by people and it's reinforced by people and this agreed upon code that we all live in called society, friends, family, but it's just made up. It's just totally made up and it's reinforced by us each and every step of the way, every day throughout life. And we're, we're sort of all co-creating this thing called existence together, whether or not we're active players in that or passive players or programmed players, you know, sort of doing the bidding of, of others. Right, is, there, not, is, there, not... is there anything wrong with the, I'm really into the show Wanda, Wanda vision right now. I'm thinking of this, but is there, is there any, problem with the sheared fiction is there a problem a if it's a fiction, fiction? Is, is it back to fiction you share it is there any inherent problem i mean I, I i think that is what it is right mm-hmm. i mean that's uh for my the, the metaphor that i use would be that you know we're all living in our own reality tunnel and i'm you know constructing meaning based on my lived experience in my tunnel and you're in your ken tunnel and then when we go to the supermarket, we're there with all the other reality tunnels that agree that this is how I'm supposed to behave when looking at apples. Right. Uh, this is how or I'm... Or my so- volume, how right. I'm supposed to sound, or how, how I'm supposed to look, what color my hat's supposed to be. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whether I should be wearing sunglasses <laughs> at midnight. Yeah. Or yeah. whatever. So we. Anything so I think, you know, we're, we're creating these things, we're enforcing these things, but when I think, why is there something rather than nothing, I think because there was an active choice for there to be something. Um, yeah, and, and will. You started you that can, you will. Can, yeah, There's you can will. passively... There's a will to sure, it. Sure, you could you could coast through life. But, you know, I used to be a middle school teacher, and I, I would say, do you, do you feel like things keep happening to you? Right. 
Right. To you, specifically. It's always you, isn't it's it? Specifically. Everywhere you go. That's it. It's just it keeps something... happening to you. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? What, right. would you, what would you guess? Right. You've been living your life. You're 12 years old. Right. You tell me. How does it go through your filter? <laughs> How does it go through your filter, that, 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 that whole thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one of the big things I want to let everybody know, uh, Peter, um, and I'll say this in general about the, the stuff you create is you, you create a lot of things. You work on the show. You create music. Uh, you know, you do stuff with video. I don't paint you do a lot of different things but one of the pieces uh as far as with what you're comfortable with or like are there places uh you know for people to find your your work or did you just want to talk a little bit more about your work on the podcast or how do people connect with the things you know your art things or what you're up to yeah we should uh we should put these all in the program notes so i make sure we get them right uh, but I have um, two projects that are personal. One one's called Detour. You can find it on Bandcamp. Detour PDP uh, is the name of that project. Uh, that's uh, sort of my first solo stuff that I did on my own. Um, uh, it originally started as a dream journal. Those were all the lyrics. I'd, I'd been keeping a dream journal for maybe a year or two. And then wow. uh, it was the first time I wasn't uh, playing in bands. Um, and so I had some time to work on a solo thing. And so I had been working on music. And um, it was a great way to have some lyrics already written for me to pull it right out of a dream journal. There's a, That project in particular uh, has uh, albums based on different points in my life. I think that first uh, dream album, it's the first one. There was one called um, Hotel Rooms. Uh, I, I had changed jobs and was on the road more. And so uh, I think it's a five track. Um, yeah. Just, you know, stuff that I made late at night in a hotel room in different parts some of lo-fi, Oregon. Some lo-fi stuff? Yeah, dancey stuff, electronic yeah, stuff. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Lay, a lot of layers. Um, I did one after that, I think, called... No, it would have been before that called Paternity or PL Paternity Leave. Recorded that just on an iPad in our piano at home and a yeah. acoustic guitar. Um, yeah, a couple different projects on that. Uh, I have uh, another project on Bandcamp called Blotter Paper, uh, which is a really fun one. It's, um, it's a great project. I've, I've listened uh, to some Blotter Yeah, paper. thank you. It's uh, yeah, Blotter Paper. Check it out on uh, it's on Bandcamp and on SoundCloud too. Um, yeah, very psychedelic, uh, noise, uh, distorted, uh, and then I employ uh, sort of a William Burroughs cut up method, where I've after I record the tracks, I completely cut it up and reorganize the entire ah. all the things. So the guitars and drums and bass and piano is completely reworked, uh, and I found that. Um, your brain will fill in the blanks and make it seem like there's a pattern and intention and purpose, yeah. uh, which is a really interesting thing to sit with. You know, how many, how many chaotic things do we interact with in our personal and professional lives that are actually just total chaos, but our mind tries to bring form to and Organizes. make it less, less weird, right? Puts it into a narrative. Yeah. Like and so this is just an interesting it. sound experiment to, to just get kind of out there. Um, so that's blotter paper. Um, I got a band called Blazar. We got a couple things on Bandcamp. Or Blazar. Band. Yeah, it's uh, I would we strung it all together once. What's Blazar? It's a uh, psychedelic, doomy, shoegaze, stoner, black metal, surf rock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jazzy improv. Yeah. I don't know. It's all. It's it's uh, friends I've been playing with for a bunch of years. It comes and, out of the soil of Eugene, Oregon. Is yeah, where it it's comes in the out rain of. and the the I think the dense pot smoke and the. Uh, uh, it's the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, West. It's, uh, it's a vibe. I think, you know, particular to Oregon, what I've always appreciated is it's, uh, it's right there r- between like L.A., San Francisco and Seattle. Right. So you have all these influences sort of that come together in this funky, this funky little town. Eugene's like the biggest little city or the littlest big city uh, that has all these uh yeah, it's a it's an incredible well, place to be, but it, the the way that music gets synthesized here, I think, draws from a lot of different um, buckets of work. Um, 
so yeah, that that band Blazar uh, is a, is a fun project. We're looking at doing some uh, live video performance this spring, uh, which I'll be excited to to share. And then uh, just finally, the work that I do here in the studio, uh, I made a little Google site. I think it's Bitly forward slash Warbling Creek Studio. We'll make sure we yeah, get we'll, that we'll right. Yeah, we'll make sure. We'll make but, sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, recording yeah. bands, uh, producing, mixing. Um, yeah, this is. Uh, I'm so happy to have you in my like proper studio to to do this podcast because it's, it's, a, it's a really blast. a special space and uh coming up on three years of living here and uh when my wife and i were looking for our, you know uh our, our next home uh, my previous house was this 1920s uh funky two-story house and uh, the studio was out in the garage which is in the back uninsulated <laughs> unheated it's a different experience. Uh, it's as actually far as... this picture up here on the wall. This, oh, uh, it's yeah, really this nice. panoramic. It was uh, so we had space heaters in the winter, and it was so hot in the summertime. We'd be just sweating in there. So when we, uh, you know, had kids and it was time to move, um, so we got to have a studio, and um, super fortunate that this actually this space was converted to and, and used as a studio. Uh, without me even knowing that when we uh, bought it, the, so the, it's uh, the, really uh, serendipitous. And, and has a great name, the Warbling Creek Studios. And the the panoramic that uh, Peter was uh, referring to is definitely I'm um, looking at as a great uh, rock posters and lights. And you imagine when you hear a garage rock sound, this is right where it comes out of. This is the soil that it comes out of. This is the concrete that's under your feet. Yeah, <laughs> and just the, loud. And then in that it's photo, fun. I it's wanted fun. to mention, uh, but prior to. To, to wrap it up, one of the things you said about the, the music scene and just my, I just wanted to mention my impression since, you know, we've been pretty music focused and we're going to be doing that, um, that uh, uh, concert, uh, concert or alternate take uh, episode is I found, now I've been around some music scenes, you know, I've had some great experiences around music, you know, New England, so I'd be in Boston, Providence, I've been around Providence scene, great scene. Uh, Washington, D.C., Washington, yeah. D.C., punk, big shows, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chicago, uh, Madison, much smaller. Been up to shows in Seattle, and uh, that's where I've seen shows have been around the scene. And get into Oregon and Portland, and for my particular tastes, which for live music, I listen to a ton of music, but live music, as you know, I love doom, I love metal, and I love seeing doom metal. I love the community. I love it. And it is an embarrassment of riches, or has <laughs> been my time in this state at almost a decade. The scene, the metal scene, the, the, the I feel it a blessing for me to have resources to be able to go see music, but that they also tend to be great local bands, reasonably priced, where I get to the point where I could see incredible music that I enjoy deeply, reasonably priced, often. Yeah. And it's that good. And I just, it's a blessing. It's a blessing, music-wise. Yeah, totally. Area. And to, for, for bands to have audiences that show up, you know, consistently. I think that's not to be underlooked, and I, and I hope, you know, more people move in that direction, you know, as things begin to open up you know, whatever that looks like in the next, you know, coming months. But to go see a play, to go see a live show on a Tuesday night, right? Like, you don't have to party every night of the week. You can just go check out a show. You know have what a, I mean? Have but a couple like, spritzers, light yeah, spritzers, Yeah, folks. you know, but we, I think, we, I, most of us have watched to the end of Netflix by now, you know? And I know it's like the there's golden age of, of television. A lot, lot of good stuff Have you seen this? There. Have you seen Like, there's so much <laughs> stuff, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's that that sort of um, the lull of the electronic screen and that Oculus Lift or uh, Rift uh, 3D yeah. immersive experience versus you know bumping into someone because you were a little too close in line, saying, "Hey, sorry about that," and they turn around and say, "Hey, no problem." Man. That's all right, man. It's all good. We'll be on a better footing uh, over time. Uh, uh, one one of the things uh, um, in 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 finishing up with with Peter, I just want to make a couple comments about the podcast. Again, we mentioned that concert episode. We we feel a, a good a good strong feeling to tap into a lot of the musical creativity. Um, have a, a a lot of fun uh, episodes coming up uh, with with painters. We've got a uh, Randy J Bird, who's a uh, uh, the photographer for um, uh, for Doomed and Stone. We got Mitra Mitchell, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic painter, 
and uh, a lot of new musical guests, uh, Spoonbenders, who will actually be on um, uh, the concert. But, um, you know, just want to thank all the artists, honestly. I mean, Peter and I are creatives. Um, all the artists that have been on this show, this is really kind of the focus of the show. And why we do it is kind of uplift, you know, a lot of independent, a lot of folks creating amazing, amazing art out there and trying to get it out into the world and including, you know, some of the, some of the music we really enjoy. I also wanted to say that, um, and I mentioned this to, to Peter, but in, in to the audience in bits and pieces, you know, looking at the show and some of the themes in the show around healing and around, you know, kind of joke about it, you know, nothingness or, or mindfulness or seeing past a lot of the chaos and a lot of the stories of artists tend to be stories of people who've experienced trauma, who are processing trauma, who I know it for myself in creating things. I'm, that's a good reason for it, for the uh, how much of me doing the podcast is me trying to pull myself and others through to the other side of non-pandemic life. I don't know psychologically there might be something to it to create 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 and show you're alive so i appreciate a lot of the creative efforts you've done uh peter and uh, open up to a lot of directions of health or uh, baseball and yeah. uh magic and yeah. and music and um one of the things i appreciate around your work and openness to the things i look to explore with guests is that the show is expansive and intends to be expansive and it's not beholden to anybody besides you or I. And that's what it is. It's to uplift right. the folks who we're around. And um, that's, right. that's kind of our ethos. And I like having that shared ethos with us being in the labor movement and concerned about mutual aid and surviving. <laughs> How about cause the mutual concern about surviving, Peter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Bread and roses, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Hey, uh, great conversation. Warbling Creek Studios, uh, Peter Bauer. And I want to force you into a position where after the end of this show, Peter's going to drop a track or two or five or seven or three or four or some <laughs> amount of a bit of a musical uh, exploration with the imprint of uh, Peter Bauer, the musical artist. Thank you so much yeah, yeah. for stepping up more towards the microphone for this episode, Peter Bauer. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, having me, Ken. And uh, yeah, we'll play, we'll play some tunes uh, on the way out. I think we'll do uh, probably a lo-fi jam that I recorded in um, quarantine over uh, Google Drive, shared uh, you know, via email and text with some friends. Uh, and then we'll probably transition to probably put one of our uh, newer Blazar bits. We've been having Blazar. some fun. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll try to get two ends, like the lo-fi chill uh, and the very intense, very loud uh, end. So it'll be fun. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Great pleasure to be able to talk with uh, your your editor and producer, uh, Peter Bauer, a wonderful creative working on this show, but also to be talking about the show a little bit more generally, you know, what we're thinking about. And we're going to try our best to um, open up avenues for you to communicate with us about, you know, maybe things you want to see, guests you want to see. And if you have a hot tip on how to get Taylor Swift onto the podcast <laughs> or some of the ones we always want through history or a seance or a medium through our historical. Yes. Oh, my answer. Finally. Yeah. No, my my answer to the historical person that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. I would want to have a conversation with. Um, I, For me, the philosopher who I find the most idiosyncratic and amazing comes from the most personal incredible story is uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. I would love to have had a conversation with Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein it was a, a, a brilliant thinker and philosopher, but he was always it was also a great eccentric and ex exhibit his genius in patents, creations, architecture, philosophy, and even went into the mountains of Austria to teach kindergarten. For three yes. to four years. Yes. Kind of weird, kind of strange. I would like to know what, what made that guy <laughs> tick on a basic level. So Wittgenstein. And you know what we're going to do? 
Wittgenstein did give an answer to something rather than nothing, Peter. So we can use it as a launching pad to figure out what Wittgenstein said about All it. All right. Uh, can you, and, and um, uh, any, any final comments or extended discussion, something rather than nothing. Peter Bauer, Eugene Oregon here. Final comments or words of wisdom for us. Take us out. Yeah, I think um, what I would uh, leave us with is maybe my, my hedonic ethos of uh, if, you're, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Uh, so given the time that we're living in now, I think it's important to, to have fun and make it your own and, and create it your own way. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Ken. That was fun. Ha, 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 ha.